Hi everyone. Well, I'm in a different studio location today, but I wanted to get this video out to talk about what are the next steps to implement the replacement of the key bridge in Baltimore following the tragic collapse last week. I want to talk about this from a technical standpoint as well as a contract mechanism standpoint. What's, what's the best bridge type to go in? What are some of the key design features that are likely to be implemented or should be implemented? And what's the best way to get a designer and a builder out there to complete this project as quickly as possible. Well, I think there's been a lot of discussion about a likely replacement bridge being a suspension bridge, and I think that's a good possibility, but I also think a cable stayed bridge would be a better option. So I'm gonna go through a few examples and talk about some of the advantages that a cable stayed bridge would have. But both bridge types have the advantage of typically having longer main spans. Certainly, the replacement bridge won't be anything like a continuous truss which collapsed uh, catastrophically once a key element had failed on the bridge. So there'll be some redundancy built into the new bridge, but I think it's going to be really important to extend the main span length. Uh, the previous key bridge had a main span distance of 1,200 feet. So I think increasing that distance between the piers on the main span will provide greater clearance to ship traffic relative to the bridge pier locations and uh, provide an extra margin of error for future collisions. Now, I've been involved with a number of projects, primarily bridge projects, in the last 20 years. And uh, my company provides construction phase testing of the foundations. Here's one of the projects that I worked on. This was over 15 years ago. This is the Christopher S. Bond Bridge over the Missouri River in Kansas City. The previous bridge was built in the 1950s and it was a suspension bridge. You can see here, for the replacement, they went with a cable stay bridge. The overall length of the bridge is 1,700 feet with the main span distance of 550 feet. I performed the testing for the drilled shaft foundation supporting the main bridge piers as well as the piling that were driven at the abutment. We provided dynamic pile testing for those. Now, the Missouri DOT, I think this is the second project where they implemented the design build delivery method, and I'll talk more about this later. But in essence, the Missouri DOT said, we've got $240 million to build this bridge, which is $326 million in today's dollars. And they went out to various design and contractor teams and solicited proposals and they selected what they considered to be the best value, the bridge with the most features, shortest construction schedule, basically the most they can get for the budget that they had on hand. So going back to the bridge types, both suspension and cable stay bridge have the advantage of the ability to support very long main spans. And I think for the key bridge replacement, if you increase the span length from say 1200 feet to say 1600 feet or greater, that's well within the capability of a cable stay bridge to support. For example, a bridge that's uh, nearing completion is the bridge across the Detroit River from Windsor, Ontario to Detroit. That's the Gordie Howe Memorial Bridge and it's a cable stay bridge and its main span length is 2,800 feet. It's really an impressive project. Uh, construction cost is over $4 billion US, but uh, Canada's foot in the bill for the entire project. We also have the Sunshine Skyway Bridge in Tampa Bay. That bridge was taken out in 1980, the original bridge, due to a freighter ship impact on one of its main piers. The bridge was rebuilt and opened, I believe, in 1987, and that's what the current bridge looks like. It has a main span length of 1,200 feet. And of course, as I mentioned in a previous video, it has extensive pier protection against ship impact. Now let's look at a couple examples of a suspension bridge. I showed you the suspension bridge in Missouri. That was the old bridge built in the 1950s before the cable stayed bridge replaced it across the Missouri River. Probably the world's most famous example of a suspension bridge is the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, California. Now with a cable stayed bridge, you have individual cables that come down from a central pier or pylon, a tower that's on top of the piers, and the cable comes down from the tower or pylon to a precast concrete segment that really is the roadway, and there are 
channels inside these precast concrete segments for post-tension steel cables, which are typically grouted in place once the tensioning load is locked off. So that provides a lot greater rigidity, but the advantage of that kind of construction system, it's, you know, for lack of a better term, kind of tinker toy, it's rather quick. You can cast these precast segments off the project location, bring them in, and basically put them in place and complete the installation. It's a much quicker installation process than you would have for a suspension bridge. And with a suspension bridge, the main cables go up over all the towers to the endpoints, and then the bridge deck is suspended from that main cable at several locations. Now, what would be the steps for designing and constructing the replacement bridge for the key bridge location? Some of you have asked in the comments whether it's possible to reuse the existing bridge foundations. Well, of course, that one pier to the right side of the channel sustained a major impact which collapsed the pier columns. And it's quite possible that the foundations supporting that pier at that location have been damaged as well. But aside from that, if you're looking at a wider span, obviously you would need piers at a different location. In my experience, existing bridge foundations are seldom reused for the construction of a new bridge, and there's a lot of reasons for that. So the first order of business that is currently ongoing right now is to remove the bridge debris from the channel. Obviously, you can't construct any new bridge until that's out of the way. That process could take, I don't know, three to four weeks. It could be quite lengthy, but it's ongoing at this time. Another key thing that would be done is to perform a geotechnical investigation which involves drilling holes to sample soil and bedrock to determine the engineering properties for design of your deep foundations and for other considerations. Sure, certainly they did some type of geotechnical investigation to support the design and construction of the original key bridge in the early 70s, but what we find in practice is that information is really not up to current standards, doesn't contain as much information as you would like from a design standpoint. And uh, for that reason, once the channel's been cleared, one of the top priorities would be to initiate a geotechnical investigation, which would probably take about two months to complete. Could, could be longer too, depending on the amount of testing. But certainly if you're in a hurry, which they will be on this bridge replacement, you can mobilize many geotechnical firms, get many rigs, collect the samples quickly, get them into the laboratory, and start the engineering evaluation of the soil and rock properties. You know, one of the reasons why they do new borings for current projects is that nowadays they determine the efficiency of the SPT hammer. So SPT is a type of impact hammer that drives a split spoon sampler into the soil or weak rock to obtain a sample and you count the number of blows that it takes to advance that sampler 12 inches, which is the blow count. But then you want to correct for the efficiency. Most modern geotechnical drill rigs have efficiencies far greater than the hammers that were used back in the 50s and 60s when the common engineering correlations between blow count and strength and compressibility and other characteristics of the soil were established. So in order to relate current blow counts with a higher efficiency, you have to apply a correction factor, which is usually you take the blow count and multiply by 1.3 to get what's considered to be a normalized efficiency of 60%, corresponding to the overall average for the older hammers. Now, the Biden administration came out early on, in fact, the day of the collapse, and said that the federal government would pay 100% of the cost for this bridge replacement. It's my intention that the federal government will pay for the entire cost of reconstructing that bridge, and I expect to, the Congress to support my effort. And that surprised a lot of people because, you know, a lot of people think that the insurance company for the ship owner should be poning up a lot of the money. We'll see what happens there, but I think what they're really saying is, the federal government's going to go out in front and then to the extent that other monies can be recovered, they'll, they'll worry about that later. I would have preferred to see something along the lines of a commitment to reduce red tape 
to me, you know, one of the next key steps, aside from the geotechnical investigation, is to what extent are they going to require the performance of an environmental impact statement study and report? Virtually every construction project is impacted by threatened or endangered species that require special accommodations during construction. There are certain times of the construction season where you're not able to work or those activities are severely restricted. I would think that the federal government would waive those requirements in order to expedite the replacement bridge construction on this project. Now let's talk about contracting mechanisms. Conventionally, the DOT will identify a bridge that needs to be replaced and they'll do various studies. They'll typically engage an engineering consultant and they'll award a contract for that consultant to perform the design of the new bridge. And while that's going on, the environmental studies are being done and the permitting and land acquisitions occurring and things like that. And typically that's a five to seven year process. A new project delivery model is, is I say new, it's, it's newer. Missouri's used it for the last 15 plus years. Other states have used it for a longer period of time. Some states are just now starting to do that. But Maryland does have a design build contracting mechanism. And how that works is the TOT will solicit proposals from various teams and they'll qual pre-qualify which teams can submit. And these teams typically consist of joint venture partners or a consortium of one or more contractors and a design engineering firm. In the, my region of practice, I'm involved with most of the major design build projects in the state of Missouri, and it's particularly in Kansas City. I've been involved with all of them. And uh, the advantages of design build is they'll go out, DOT will go out and solicit proposals and usually request a preliminary design, say maybe to the 35% level, and they'll pick what they think is the best overall value, uh, the best type of bridge for the given project. And then they'll select that team and then they'll pay the losing team some amount of money for their effort. And then they'll go forward. The advantage of the design build mechanism is that you could really start some aspects of the construction before design is complete. In a conventional design bid build, the design is completed, plans and specs are issued by the DOT a month or more in advance of what they call a, the bid opening or the bid letting date. And contractors have to go through and put together detailed cost estimates, schedules, and submit a, a price for individual line items. And of course there's a total. And the DOT will decide whether they're gonna award the contract. And a big part of that is whether the low bidder uh, overall price is within the engineer's estimate for the construction of that project. And if so, it takes a month or two to award the project and off they go. In this case, the design build contractor is responsible for maintaining his own schedule, his own design and construction milestones. And there's just a lot more flexibility. Of course, the DOTs have a review authority to make sure everything's going according to the requirements for the project. So while I'm on the topic of some of the technical details, a most likely foundation type to support the piers for the main spans will be a drilled shaft foundation. Drilled shafts involve drilling excavation of the soil and rock to create an opening that is filled with steel reinforcement and concrete to create a structure that can support high lateral loads and overturning moments. And so when you're talking about long span lengths, drill shafts are typically used to support such foundations. In fact, on that Christopher S. Bond bridge replacement over the Missouri River, I performed the construction phase testing for the drill shafts, and those were used at the main pier. See, so you're advancing an auger, in this case, through the soil. They really don't show rock drilling here. And use trimmies a trimmy to place the concrete in a bottom-up fashion. This is a smaller foundation used for a sign pole or light pole foundation along a highway, but it's the same concept for bridge foundations. So it shows them inserting the reinforcing steel for the cage, 
They're filling up the CSL pipe, so they'll do cross-hole sonic logging as the integrity test method for the drill shaft to identify any zones of low density concrete or soil inclusions. And then they place concrete in a trimmy that fills the pipe, and they'll bring that pipe up periodically in five or 10 foot intervals such that the bottom of the trimmy is always below concrete. So it essentially for, forms a bulb and concrete comes up displacing all the soil and water and they'll overfill or overflow the drill shaft installation to make sure they have good concrete all the way to the top of the drill shaft. So with everything considered, I think they're gonna go with a design build delivery. I think they're likely to select a cable stayed bridge option. I think the bridge could be built in three years, but that's gonna be really tough and perhaps explains the $2 billion price tag. I think under normal circumstances, this bridge might be replaced for around a billion dollars, but with accelerated construction, I think $2 billion plus is not out of the question. So I wanna send out a shout out to the channel members. I really appreciate your support and the list of channel members is growing. Channel members typically get a preview of these videos in advance of them being made public. I also want to send a shout out to those of you who have provided super thanks. That's another way to support the channel. And of course, to thank all of you who have liked, subscribed, and left comments to these videos. Please check out my free digital download of the biggest civil engineering disasters in the past 100 years. There's a link in the description. Thanks very much, everyone.